Today's speaker is Brian Fruit. Brian is the owner of Lizard Skins, a Utah company that specializes in accessories for baseball, cycling, and lacrosse. Lizard, Lizard Skins has been operating since 1993 with sales to over 80 countries. In an ultra-competitive world, Lizard Skins has achieved growth for 10 straight years. Lizard Skins believes in working with the top athletes in the world. They are extremely proud, proud to be the official bar tape sponsor of movie star Lodo Sudal and MTM, man, I should have talked to you about these words, Quebeca. <laughs> it doesn't look like Quebeca right here, but, and I'm from Canada. I know how to spell Quebec, but that was funny. Come on, give me some love. God. Cumulatively, they rank, they've racked up five stage wins, second and third overall, the white jersey, and the number one team overall in the 2015 Tour de France. Pretty cool. Top Major League Baseball players like Hunter Pence, Anthony Rizzo, David Ortiz, David Wright, Russell Martin, and many others from all 30 Major League Baseball teams have found Lizard Skins DSP back grip to give them an advantage at the plate. This association with so many Major League Baseball players has skyrocketed sales in the last two years. Brian is accompanied here today with his wife, Annette. Uh, Annette is from, Southern, from Northern California, San Jose. Brian is from Porterville. They met at BYU. Brian graduated with a business degree and an emphasis in international finance. Brian graduated in 92, and uh, later that summer married his wife, Annette, and then she graduated, graduated later that year. They have four children, Bailey, who is uh, attending BYU right now, Allie, who is uh, at Pleasant Grove High School, Zach, and Zoe round out their four children. So let's give a round of applause to Brian Fruit. I'm going to avoid that. Are we on here? Okay. I don't want to be behind that too much. Um, so it's exciting to be here with all of you today. Uh, Brad's a good friend of mine, and uh, it, uh, you got to be careful being friends with Brad, apparently. Otherwise, you get roped into this. <laughs> so Lizard Skins has been in business uh, since 1993. Um, we started out uh, very, very small. Uh, I was actually a student uh, at BYU, and I had the opportunity to, um, to buy some parts from a company going out of business in Salt Lake, and over a period of about six weeks, realized that I really enjoyed the bicycle industry. Um, was able to, uh, to make some fun contacts during that, uh, during that time when we were liquidating those parts, and it led into the opportunity to uh, to start Lizard Skins. Uh, our very first month at Lizard Skins was, was small. Uh, I think that we did um, you know, less than $500 of total sales that first month. So when you say grassroots, you know, starting from nothing, that's, that was us for sure. Uh, we started off with a chainstay protector, which uh, protects the frame from getting damaged. And um, we got what was called a design patent on that. Um, there's a difference between a design patent and a utility patent, which I learned later. Uh, pretty expensive uh, learning experience. So we created a niche, and uh, in the cycling world, everyone uses some type of a chainstay protector now, and they generally call it a lizard skin. But they're not all lizard skins. There's a lot of copies out there because we got the wrong type of patent. But uh, still a good learning experience. Um, as we went along as a small company, uh, trying to find our way and our look and our style. Uh, the, the logo has taken uh, a few changes um, in, in the way that it's been rendered, uh, which has been kind of, uh, kind of fun as we, as we go along. The products have also changed. Uh, had a lot of fun working with, uh, with our designer at Lizard Skins, trying to put together um, this uh, PowerPoint. And he's actually a, a UVU alumni. Uh, so it was kind of fun for him to, to help put this together. And looking back through some of the old products, on the very top up there, that's a slick grip. We actually made those here in Utah, um, and it was our first grip. Uh, it's pretty, pretty fun to look at you know, what that is today. But we did shin guards and rear suspension boots and 
Uh, in the middle of the tall grip, there's a lock-on grip. It has little aluminum clamps. Um, I was thinking about some of the impact that, that UVU has had for me. And years ago, um, probably 10 years, I'm going to guess, yeah, at least 10 years ago, uh, Rick Farr was uh, implement or helping with, uh, with these lecture series. And a friend of mine was a student, and he said, hey, you know, we like to go to lunch together. Why don't we just come and listen to this lecture series for lunch instead? So I said, yeah, that'd be great. We'll do that once a week. And that particular year, Rick had tapped into a group called Young Entrepreneur Organization. And uh, that has since morphed into just be Entrepreneur Organization, because frankly, we're not all that young anymore. Um, but they had three or four speakers that year from this business group. And uh, I ultimately ended up joining that business group. And I think that's the real reason we've had 10 years of growth. So it's, it's pretty cool to see how that goes full circle and how coming to a, a lecture series at UVU has really impacted our business, which you'll see uh, moving forward. But these lock-on grips, uh, one of the speakers at the uh, UVU lecture series that, that I went to talked about packaging and DVD with maybe a cookbook or something of that nature. So, wow, we have DVDs on mountain biking. We make these cool grips. So we put it together. And uh, it, was, it was awesome. The first batch of those we did, we sold um, about 10,000 units just in a few weeks. Uh, so we're like, hey, this is pretty cool. Um, and so that, that's, uh, those memories are coming back now as, as I'm standing here. Uh, we were able to um, branch into making a road bike tape uh, called DuraSoft Polymer, DSP for short. And the idea with that was is we would, we went and visited with some manufacturers in other industries. And we we're like, can you guys help us make a mountain bike grip? Well, sure. And what they were going to present to us just didn't make any sense. But my general manager's like, you know, literally as we're walking out the door, could you make a tape for us? Sure, we could make a tape. And over about mm, nine months, we were able to get this tape prototyped and rolled it out um, to the world for road bikes. It was completely different than anything else on the market. It was quite expensive um, compared to the, uh, to the other products, but it had a very unique feel and it was extremely lightweight and it had these vibrant colors that nobody else had. And it, it was scary. You know, we had to, uh, we had to take out a lot of debt um, really risk a lot of things to do this. And we, we made a, an order for a, of a container uh, in Asia and brought it over. And my general manager said, hey, you know, by the way, if this container sells, we probably need another container to back that up. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I've already taken this huge risk with one container. Like, what if it doesn't sell? But what if it does? Like, we're going to need stuff to fill the pipeline. So we went ahead and bought another container. And the distributors that we worked with all over the world, they're like, you guys are crazy. Like, this stuff is expensive. Like, how's this going to work? And I'm like, well, it, is it unique? Is it special? I mean, what do you think of the product? Oh, this stuff's the best. So place a small order, and let's see what happens. If it doesn't work, you, you have a very small hole to dig out of. Like, you just put it on closeout, and it, it's not going to hurt you at all. But for us, we'll have two containers of it. So we're going to have a hole that's going to take us years to dig out of. But let's give it a try. And they did. They liked that. They liked that explanation. And uh, sure enough, now it's been, I think, eight years, uh, eight or nine years. We're the number one aftermarket handlebar tape in the world. Again, it's a small niche. You know, we're not making cars. We're making you know, bicycle accessories. Um, but we've been able to... Um, have some really fun experiences, which I'll kind of show you with that, with people using this tape. And, and people are totally fine paying just a little bit extra because it's a really nice product. We love to work with top athletes. Uh, that's a big thing for us. Um, we've, we've always tried to associate um, with top athletes. And in the beginning, 
you know, maybe the top athlete was the guy that was really fast from Utah County. And then maybe it went to the guy that was really fast from Colorado. At some point, this company got big enough, we were able to attract the very, very, very top athletes in the field. So this is Steve Pete. Uh, he, we do a signature grip with him called the Petey. And Steve is a world champion. So uh, they have a series every year, and he won that series and became the world champion. Kind of looked at as a legend today. And that was our best-selling grip uh, for many years. Um, we also work with athletes in the BMX world. Sam Willoughby is a silver medalist in the Olympics. He's also a number one pro. Uh, Anneke Bertin uh, is from the Netherlands. Uh, Sam is actually from Australia. Uh, Anneke is from the Netherlands. She is currently the Enduro uh, European champion or European Enduro champion. She's been number one um, in four cross. Um, and I think she ended up fourth overall uh, in the season last year. So Luke is part of the LaPierre team and uh, one of the top finishers in downhill. So this is, uh, this is the three teams that we sponsored in the Tour de France this year. Uh, we work with um, Lotto Sudal and they're the owner of Ridley. His name is Joachim, he's out of Belgium. Um, we spoke with him at a trade show maybe 10 days ago and we're like, hey, are we good for next year as well? He's like, Absolutely, we'd never change. We love your stuff. Uh, the MTN Quebec. Um, how many of you saw that horrible crash in the Tour of Utah where the rider hit the, the car? Okay, that was an MTN Quebec rider. Uh, and he is okay, and he's been released from the hospital. So we were happy to see that. It was a horrible crash. So the idea with the MTN Quebec um, team is they're trying to bring some some publicity to the situation in, in Africa, um, trying to raise some money for that. And it's the first time that there's ever been an African team uh, that's been part of the Tour de France. And so this particular photo here uh, in the middle, that's the first time somebody from South Africa had ever had the polka dot jersey. Uh, who knows what the polka dot jersey is? Tell me. The climber's jersey. All right, are you a t-shirt or a hat guy? All right, what size do you like? Well, I think I can help you out there. Let's just find. Look at that. Okay, that's not against the rules in here, right? There we go. A lot of rules. Yeah, as long as there's a lid on it. Great. So really cool opportunity uh, to, to be part of history there. And then uh, Movistar. Anybody know who this rider is here? Well, yeah, somebody else. We've got one cyclist guy here. No one else? Oh, boy. Yeah? It's a cell phone service. No, right here in the white jersey. White jersey. Anyone? I'll give you a hint. He's from Colombia. Is it Quintana? It's Nairo Quintana. You a hat or t shirt guy? Hat, small, medium, large? All right, we'll get this passed out here. We'll, uh, I'm not sure how well this is gonna go, but let's give it a try here. Oh, that was close. I got to the row. Should get something for that. So Nairo Quintana. So um, he took second in the Tour de France uh, two years ago and I love watching the tour in July. That's like my favorite thing to do. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I watch a lot of TV in that month. Uh, wake up early and I gotta get my fix in before I go to work, but love watching the tour. Um, Nairo just was spectacular. He took second overall. And uh, I told my marketing guy, we gotta have this team. He's like, sweet, you're going for it. Yeah, I love this. What's my budget? We gotta have this team. I heard you, that's sweet, what's our budget? I gotta have this team. So you're not gonna give me a number? No, I'm not gonna give you a number. You gotta figure it out though, I gotta have this team. So he was able to negotiate with uh, Movistar and the bicycle they ride, which is Canyon, and lo and behold, we were able to get a, a deal put together. Um, 
I spent a couple of years in Columbia, so there was definitely a connection there, and I felt like this guy had the potential to win the tour overall. Last year, Nairo won the Giro d'Italia, which is the second largest bicycle race in the world, and this year he got second in the tour again, so he's now had two seconds in the tour and a first in the Giro. Um, my money's on him for next year, so uh, I think it'll be awesome. And this was, uh, my wife and I were able to go over and spend uh, some time at the tour this year. Uh, this is the Movistar bus. They have about 10 different vehicles that they use to support these races. It's quite small, but you can see our little tiny logo there. I don't know how much per square inch we're paying for that, but it's a lot. <laughs> so this is one side of their big truck. It's the coolest thing ever. It's like a big work truck, but it has big slide outs, and it's just filled full of like $10,000 bikes. So I don't know if there's a, you know, a couple hundred thousand or half a million worth of bikes in this truck, but you know, for a bicycle guy, it was, it was heaven. So they had to pull me out of there. Um, you can see Nairo's bike here, so it's pretty exciting. Everyone on that team uses lizard skins. And a lot of times when you're sponsoring something, somebody, they'll use your stuff, but they're maybe not excited about it. All three teams that we sponsor, I spoke to at the tour, all just thrilled with the product. They love it, and they feel like it gives them uh, more control on their bike. Another thing, we'll switch gears away from the tour. Um, we want to try to give back, if at all possible, in our, in our space, in our industry. So we're part of the MTN Quebec program. Uh, we created some specialty grips. So we do the North Shore grip, and a portion of the sales from the North Shore grip go, and go to build and maintain trails up on the North Shore, which is a big destination for cyclists. And then we did one right here in our own backyard, Moab. So a little portion of the sales for Mo the Moab grip go to build and maintain trails down in Moab. Uh, this year, um, was it March? February, March? I think it was around March. We went down to Moab and uh, I took my, my little son, who was 13 at the time, and we did a fun ride with, uh, with Poison Spider. They call it their, uh, the Thaw event or the Legends ride. I figured out what Legends means. It just means you're old. <laughs> so, but we had a good time out there and we presented a nice little check. Uh, and the people in Moab were, were really quite excited because you know, that helped them build more trails, create more access. I've been going to uh, Moab since I was a college student. And um, so the, uh, probably have 25 years of, of going to Moab a couple times a year, three, four times a year. And I just absolutely love riding down there. So three and a half years ago, uh, we had the opportunity to, to maybe go after something a little different. Uh, some of the tape that we had for cycling was being used on baseball bats. I had a good friend, uh, one of my old college roommates. He was getting the tape and putting it on bats, and that was kind of his way to pay for the gas to get his kids to all the baseball tournaments. And he, and he had three boys, so he went to a lot of baseball tournaments. And he's like, this stuff is killer. you got to do something with it. And my general manager at the time who helped develop the road bike tape his kids were also into baseball, and he's like, we should do something with this. So things started to come together, and we made some tape, and we packaged it specifically for baseball, and we made it in specific baseball thicknesses because the cycling tape is a little thicker, and we made a different backing, a different uh, underlayment, adhesive, all that. And we went to a show, and it's called the American Baseball Coaches Association, and it was in Anaheim that year, and we won best of show. And guess what happened? Anyone? Nothing. Nothing happened. <laughs> we won this award, which is the lousiest logo ever. I mean, like, they need to go back to college on that. That's, that's horrible. Um, and nothing happened. I mean, we didn't, nothing. So, like, wow. Okay. And, you know, we focused on selling bicycle stuff, and we made a couple of calls, and there was a couple of people buying it in baseball, and, and honestly, I think we ended the year with 
twenty or thirty thousand dollars of sales, and we probably had twice that much in expenses. Uh, like, huh? Well, that was exciting. Um, and then we went to another show, and a local by the name of John Buck. Anybody in here know John Buck? We built you know John. All right, that's good for something right there. <laughs> T-shirt, hat. Well, what are you? Are you a baseball guy? A little bit. Because I got some baseball tape, too. I'll be a okay, what size? A large. Large? I got red or I got a Nairo shirt. You want a Nairo shirt? Sure. You can rock that pink of pride, dude. So John Bach, who's a local pro, was a catcher for the New York Mets at the time. Lives in Bluffdale. Um, he wanted to go to the trade show. So he called his... Taylorsville High School coach and says, man, I really want to go to this show, but it's sold out. This is a pro. I don't know how many millions of dollars he makes a year, but he's calling his high school coach to try to figure out how to get into this show. So it's pretty cool to see the influence there. He's like, I think lizard skins have a booth. Do you think they would let me show my product inside their booth? I don't know. We could, you should ask. You know them, you ask. So the Taylorsville High School coach calls our GM, whose name is Brad. Not this Brad, but this would be a good Brad too. And he, Brad's very quick on his feet. And he says, absolutely. You bet. Yeah, come join us. Be part of our booth. It was a 10 foot by 10 foot booth. So we were standing side by side with this pro player for the whole entire weekend. And we left the show and John's like, you need to make a version of this tape that's thinner. You make a 1.8, which the softball people love. You make a 1.1, which the Little League kids love. And, you know, aluminum composite bat people. He goes, you need to make a really thin version for wood bats, and the pros will use it. There's no way. I mean, Major League Baseball has, like, it's steeped in history. They put that sticky stuff on there, and, you know, they, they use a wood bat. They're never going to use some tape. You need to do it. I will use it, and I will get other people to use it. This is never going to work, but what the heck? We made it um, because it's a pro player, and he's like, I'll use it. So we did it. We made a .5, and uh, that was in 2013. Um, and oh, my goodness, it starts showing up. So one night, I get a text, and my friend, one of the guys from work, is like, look at this. And one of the announcers talks about John Buck's bat for about four minutes, and they say, this lizard skin, they even pronounced it wrong, this lizard skin stuff is different, and look at what John's doing. And at that time, he was the number one uh, hitter for the, for the season. Um, didn't keep that for long, but long enough for us to get that four minutes. Um, and, and then we started sending the samples to other people. David Wright started using it. Um, we did crazy colors, some camos. We did some real bright colors like lime green and neon yellow. And the players loved it. You can see the three thicknesses we do there. So players get traded. They love this team and they work there for a while, but boom, now they're off to another team. And so they take their gear, including their tape and their box of tape, and they go to the next one. And we start working with equipment managers. Well, before you know it, we get an invitation to go to the equipment manager show w with Major League Baseball. And we were able to convert that into all 30 Major League Baseball teams actually buying product from us for their players. So this is some of the athletes that we currently have endorsement deals with. Um, there's a significantly larger number of athletes that use the product, um, but these are the ones we have permission to, uh, to use their names. So Hunter Pence, um, David Wright, Anthony Rizzo, Big Poppy. I'm sure there's a few of you here that know Big Poppy. So you guys might not know Nairo, but you probably have heard of Big Poppy. So what is, uh, what's, what's Big Poppy coming up on right now? What's, what's, the, what's the historic thing that's going to happen hopefully in the next few weeks? What is it? 500 home runs. So he's coming up on 500 home runs, which is kind of a big deal. So 
uh, three weeks ago, the equipment manager for the Red Sox said, David is coming up on 500 home runs. That's a big deal. We need to do something for it. Why don't you make a special tape for him? So we reached out. This tape is actually made in China. It's a, it's a large factory over there uh, in the south of China. Um, you know, interestingly, um, you know, we hear a lot of stories about how uh, bad factories are, how bad the treatment is. You know, there's even stories about how, um, you know, there's, there's that ladies aren't necessarily given opportunities to, to be, be in charge of much. We have just the opposite effect. It's a 1,600 employee factory, and there's a woman running it, and she is absolutely in charge, and she's so smart. So we reach out to her, and she's like, oh, we totally want to be involved in this. So here's a, chi here's a company based. They have an American owner, but all their manufacturing is in China. And they make a custom edition of the tape that says 500 home runs on it. And it goes from a concept to product in David Ortiz's hands in less than three weeks. We're talking molds, manufacturing, shipping, design, everything. And so this is one of David's sign bats here. And we wrapped the tape on it yesterday. And uh, you'll see that on TV. You'll probably see it on Sports Illustrated. And this will end up. Not this particular bat, but the one that David uses for the 500th home run will end up in the Hall of Fame. So we're pretty excited about that. That'll be our second product in the Hall of Fame because David's bat from the first World Series, well, from, from last year's World Series, or year before that, sorry, ended up in the Hall of Fame. So, so we're pretty excited about that. Work with Russell Martin um, and I was watching a game the other night, and they were just ripping home runs like no tomorrow, and the tape just shows up. So anytime you're watching a baseball game, look for some colorful tape on the bat, you will probably, uh, that's gonna be lizard skins. So these top sluggers love the tape, and the media loves them. So our first, let's see right here. Our first cover of Sports Illustrated, it's probably hard to see from there, but you can see that Prince Fielder has some blue tape on his bat. So we get a call from some friends and said, hey, have you seen the front cover of Sports Illustrated? No. Well, your tape is on there. And like, oh, that's kind of cool. So we run down to the store and they're sold out, so we have to order one online. And then David Ortiz and the Red Sox win the uh, World Series. And bam, the tape shows up again. Uh, we end up uh, last year during the, uh, during the World Series, and Hosmer loves the tape as well. So shows up there, Hunter Pence up above. So we end up with five covers of Sports Illustrated with our tape showing up, which is unheard of. We're not Nike, we're not Under Armour. We're located less than two miles from the campus here. I mean, it's just, we're, we're a local, Orem, Utah Company, and we've changed Major League Baseball. Here's a little bit of uh, some social media pieces. Um, now, most of these are not our photos, and and uh, you know we 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 didn't uh, we don't use these on our social media because we don't have permission to use the Dodgers or stuff like that. But just kind of fun for a presentation like this to show off some of the stuff happening. This is the uh, Dodgers dugout, and uh, you can see how many of the bats actually have lizard skins tape on it. Um, we had a really good year last year, and uh, a couple of the key, uh, um, my sales manager and general manager said, man, we need to re reward everybody. Let's go, let's go watch a baseball game. So we took the day off of work, flew everybody to Arizona. Uh, Luis Gonzalez actually hosted us. Uh, we were all able to go down on the field for batting practice and uh, as, a, as an entire company. So I think there was about 25 of us that flew down, um, spent the night, and then everybody um, you know, flew home or did whatever they wanted the next day. But it was really fun to be able to have a group like that be down on the field. Um, this one, that's a little bit faded there, might be kind of hard, but um, it's Bono from U2. And apparently he was hanging out with Hunter Pence. 
And he thought, man, that'd be kind of fun to like take a photo with Hunter Pence's bat. So this gets sent out all over the world through Twitter, I believe. And here's Bono with lizard skins on the bat. So a couple other uh, shots there. You can see uh, the tape on, on some of those other bats uh, in the dugouts. So pretty exciting stuff. A lot of this is sent out by Major League Baseball. Um, with all the pros using it, then Commerce says, holy cow, we need to get a part of that. We want to be part of that. So it's a pull through the system. So we ended up putting a deal together with Dick Sporting Goods, and they're by far the 800-pound gorilla in the sporting goods space. They're going to, they're going to rough you up, if, if at all possible. Um, but they, they also can move some serious quantity of product. It's a public company, and, and if they can sell it, they, they don't lack money to go buy it. Um, so they put some in some stores and it does well and they put some more in some more stores and oh my goodness it's going nuts and one of the big executives for Dix is like what are we doing like we got to get behind this stuff like quit messing around um, and so the buyer just goes for it and they talk us into paying for 20 end caps so the end caps we're expecting is like the one in the top corner here and they, they even allowed us to do our own graphic on the top, which is apparently not normal for Dick Sporting Goods. And we paid, I don't know, a few thousand dollars, two or three grand, and we were able to, and that was the, the cost to print the header cards for 20 um, end caps. They liked our artwork. We made half the artwork with Hunter Pence, kind of West Coast, the other half with David Wright, kind of East Coast, and away we went. Dix put it in all 600 stores, and they only charged us for 20. And it sold like crazy. So each store is different. Some stores are bigger in baseball, some are smaller. Uh, the middle one here, that's a smaller baseball store. The one in the corner is obviously a bigger baseball store. This one is actually Shields up in Sandy, so right here close, close to home. They said, wow, we love local companies and we'd like to maybe make a little bigger presentation. So they went from selling a couple hundred dollars of product um, on each order to a thousand plus dollars of product on each order. So increased their sales dramatically. This is our team. I don't think things really happen by myself, um, I, it's, it's the team here. Brad is the general manager in the blue shirt there. Um, we have a lot of UVU students that actually work with us, uh, you know, whether they're in the shipping department or uh, in uh, production, um, and it's good. One of the guys here um, is uh, part of our team. He's a pretty crucial part. Uh, it was kind of a neat opportunity there. He graduated. Um, from UVU, I think, uh, with an associates. And uh, he's like, all right, you know, where's my raise? I'm like, oh, I mean, nothing's different from what you were doing yesterday till today. So, I mean, just because you got the associates doesn't mean there's an automatic raise. And, uh, and so, you know, we struggled. We were, we were having a hard time, like, getting our groove going right. Um, and, and somebody else offered him a job at a huge improvement of, of, of compensation, huge. I'm like, oh, and I started thinking about it, and I said, you know, and, and he was nice about it. He's like, I really like it here. I like what I'm doing, um, but this is a big raise. Um, this is a good opportunity. So we made a decision that we would match that price, and he made a decision to stay, and it has turned out to be an absolute wonderful thing for both of us. He's a huge part of my team, and I think he thoroughly enjo enjoys his job and the things that he's getting to do. Um, and, and so I would, I'd encourage you guys, as you get out there in the workforce, communicate with, with the company you work for. Um, a lot of times people are maybe afraid to, to talk, um, and they will just maybe jump or you know, leave or you know, maybe they like where they're at, but you know, somebody else is offering a couple dollars more, so they're just gonna go do that. But this particular employee, he was real nice about how he communicated it. He's like, I like it here, I like what I'm doing. Um, 
but this is a big race. And uh, can we have a talk about it? It took a little time. It didn't happen overnight. Um, but we were able to uh, keep him as part of our team. And that's happened actually with, with quite a few of the employees. Um, if you end up at a smaller company, there's not an HR department. And so those conversations probably need to happen because owners get tied up with trade shows and trying to make sure that all the paperwork gets done and you know, where, where the next product's coming from. But um, the cool thing on being on a smaller team is you really can feel like you're moving the needle. Um, you know, this particular guy helped put this presentation together for me. So I'd be in trouble today if he wasn't still with me. So this is the future. Um, well, it's, it's, it's the future home at least. We are building a new building. It's on the 5th East and American Fork. Um, it's right next to the Four Food Groups building. Um, and so the walls are uh, up on the building now and the trusses are uh, in and they'll be putting the decking on the, on the trusses shortly. Fingers crossed, um, December, January, we'll be able to, uh, to move into the new place. Brad's promised to put his work clothes on and come help us. Maybe he can solicit a few of you strong guys to come with him. So, um, Brad wanted to make sure I left a little time for, um, for questions. So, um, what, uh, anyone have any questions on, on what we do? Are you moving more um, local production, or is that the reason for the increase of size of your building? That's a great question. Um, let's get you a, let's get you a little, what size are you? Large, boss. Might, let's see if we got a large. Ooh, we do. Okay, let's see how good we are. I, I got to try it. I mean, I never could do this when I was a student. All right, you ready? Yeah. Ooh, hey, good snag. The guy behind you is happy. <laughs> All right, uh, so our, our motto basically is we're going to make this stuff wherever it makes the most sense. So some companies um, are averse to employees and they don't want to have any employees in their building or they want to minimize it as much as possible. So they just want to farm everything out. Um, other companies are just bent on making everything in-house. Um, we'll just do whatever makes the most sense. So we make uh, about 10 to 15% of all of our products here in-house. Uh, and then the rest is imported from either uh, China or Taiwan. Uh, the UK, um, multiple sources here in the United States. Uh, we make some stuff up in uh, West Valley. We make some stuff out in Riverside, California. Um, so the reason for the new building is the growth. So is the short answer. But, but we'll make it wherever it makes the most sense. So we're right now looking to do some new manufacturing in, in Vietnam. Um, let's go with this guy over here. Absolutely, yeah. Um, what, what, what are the size of you? Don't tell me large, because we're out of large. Okay, let's see, maybe. Oh, medium, XL. Got some lizard skin bat tape, and I got some hats. Oh yeah, I got that. All right. We're gonna have a hard time getting this up there. Oh, close. Okay, um, so. We do plan on going into other sports. Uh, we have a lacrosse program that's going on right now. Uh, the actual um, individual that's running our lacrosse program is actually a student here at UVU right now. We work around this program, so it's kind of crazy. Comes in for a couple hours, goes to school, comes back for an hour. Um, but he's doing a pretty good job. He will actually beat the first year of baseball. Um, I don't know what will happen the second year, but the first year with lacrosse is going to actually be faster than the first year of baseball. And then I would assume that uh, hockey and racket sports would be coming next. A oh, woman, perfect, because we've got some girl shirts. Hey, I was wondering, so how do you market in other countries besides just using like their... That's a great one. That is a great one. Um, I have some, some lady t-shirts here. I'll let you. What size? So you don't have to ask them. Yeah, I got, I got three here. My wife will show you. You can. There you go. Go side. Perfect. Um, so we go to trade shows all over the world. We just got back from Eurobike, which is in Friedrichshafen, Germany. 
Uh, it is a crazy show. There's no hotels. You're driving forever. Oh, it's just nuts. They have air conditioning. They never turn it on. Like, ah, oh, it's nuts. But um, we, we try to come up with different angles. So we go to that show. People from all over the world come to that show. It's the largest bicycle trade show in the world. And they have over 300 doors, door handles, coming in and out of the different halls of the show. It's a, it's a crazy design. It's not one big room. It's a whole bunch of rooms. And we wrap every one of those door handles with our lizard skins tape. So even though we're a small company, we have a huge like, impact at this show. Um, we also will get online and we'll see what other companies, who they're using. Like, who do they have in the UK? Who do they have in Germany? Uh, we go to festivals. Um, back before the internet was so big, we would just look at the back of people's catalogs. And, and we make a lot of calls, you know, a lot of emails. Back in the day, you'd send faxes. Many of you don't remember that, but <laughs> it would be a fax. Okay, let's go right here. We've had some people talk to us about ski grips, you know, that our tape could work well in that market. Um, it's probably not on our short-term radar. So, yeah. Up there in the top, uh, we've got another gal, I think. Um, when you set up the manufacturing in other companies, in other countries, yes. do you personally go or do you use the mediator? Um, we want to manage all that ourselves. So, so, yeah, we do it. We don't go over there a lot. You know, there's this cool thing called FedEx, and like you uh, send them what you want, and they send you a sample. And so it's amazing, like how smooth that works. Like this sample of this tape, that's three weeks, like crazy, like from concept to completion, three weeks. So it's pretty awesome. But I have been to all the factories, and and I will say every single one of the factories that I've been to, I'm absolutely blown away by the quality and and you know what it's like in there, right here. So that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, see if we've got, let's see if we got anything else there. So there was a, uh, a friend of mine that's in my business group, and he's got a nephew, and apparently this kid's super smart. Like, he's gotten all kinds of awards in school, and, you know, he's messing everybody else's curve up. Um, that's the kid. So he's like, man, this, you know, we were trying to hire for the baseball division, and, uh, he came over. And so t tell me about yourself. Well, you know, I'm so and so student, and uh, I, I, I need I need to work at a job for a little while so I can so I can get my master's. Uh, I'm not going to be allowed to get into the master's program until I I work somewhere for a little while. And that was it, man. That interview was over. It was like three minutes. Like he didn't care one bit about me and my company. He wanted experience so he could get his master's. And he sent me an email last week. He's still looking for a job. So it's, it's got to be a win-win. Like, if I hire somebody, I'm going to put tens of thousands of dollars into them. I'll even go this far that this is a great basis for you, but I'm going to hone you, and I'm going to make you even better. Like, the, the amount of no, no one has ever left me and gotten less money. You know, <laughs> they have more skills. So... Think about that, get into the place that's gonna help you get more knowledge and help you move up that scale, but don't, don't try to take from that company what you want. You know, give them what they need and you're gonna get what you want. Does that make sense? Up here in the hat. For those that are uh, looking to start their own business. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> what, you, uh, you did it in 93? Started in 93. Um, yeah, learn, learn how to get by without a lot of sleep. So that, that'd probably be, I mean, I don't, maybe pocket knowledge? 
Patent knowledge is an awesome one. Yeah, that, that, was, that was probably a, a million dollar plus mistake. Maybe a couple million dollar mistake. It, it takes a ton of time and effort. Last night, I think, I got home at 11. Uh, so I came home, tucked the kids in, went to the little scout thing. Our little boy got five merit badges, so we we're pretty excited about that. And uh, then back to work to make sure that um, you know, everything was taken care of, get our shipments coming. Um, but I love listening to other people. I love talking to other people and, and trying to learn. Some people may learn from a book. Other people may learn from coming to a, to a, a lecture series like this. I did. I, I went to BYU. And, and I went to this lecture series um, every single semester. My entire, once I took the first one, I always took it. It, it was like a one credit class. It was, it was an easy A. And I learned so much from it. So, you know, take those opportunities to learn and talk to other people. Um, right here in front there. Oh. Uh, no, it was awesome. That whole uh, 2001 to 2005. Yeah. That was the, you, I was reading your blog talking about the debt you guys were in. What kind of motivated you? To so, so 2001 to 2005, I bought my partner out, and um, and so there was goods and bads there. The goods was is now we had control and we could kind of take it the way we want. We just didn't have a lot of money, um, but once we got him paid off because it was a it was a royalty payment, it was a workout. Um, so he got the maximum amount, um, but he had to kind of take it you know, over a four or five year. Uh, and, and it just kept us poor. Once that was over, then it really started to rock. So Brad, are we out of time? We got one more? One more. One more. I just had a question. Um, how does your company view your, what is your position on corporate ethics um, and social responsibility when you're sending work overseas? Do you have some sort of process for ensuring that your partners overseas are, they have ethical manufacturing processes? We do. So we go and visit all these places. We actually watch our stuff being made. Um, if we can make it here in the U.S., we absolutely do. Um, there's just some stuff that's pretty hard to make here now. Um, we have a big solar array up on top of our building, so we're trying to um, reduce our carbon footprint from that. Uh, all of our paper that we use for catalogs and packaging is all done through renewable um, resources. They call it FSC, so it's Forest Steward Se Stewardship Council. Um, and these factories over there, I mean, I, I think the news kind of blows it up. Like, everyone that I've been to has been nicer than the stuff I see here. So it's, like, it's very clean. It, the whole idea of like a drippy roof with like one little light bulb is not like that. Being run by 10 -year no, 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 no. It's Good not. question. Well, thanks for that. Let's give Brian a round of applause. Appreciate you being here again. Two things real quick. Um, Brian is on our National Advisory Council and he will be here on the 25th, Friday the 25th. If if you want to meet with him and other of our National Advisory Council members, that would be a great opportunity. So Mickey we can help coordinate that, and there'll be word coming out through other professors to let you know about that opportunity. And then this Saturday is uh, an event, Slide the City. We've partnered, Business School has partnered with Slide the City to do a big slip and slide out here on 800 South. So you as students get uh, a 50% discount as you view. So I think you need to go to their web page or Facebook page and you can get that code to register 50%. And then if, uh, if there's a couple people in this class that want to volunteer, I need to get some flyers out, and I can probably get you in free if you want to go on Saturday, but I just need some help for that. So come see me after. And then for those that are joining us for lunch, we'll be up there in just a little bit. But uh, you're welcome to come down and talk to Brian real quick, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much.